Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. Tonight, um, the topic on my thoughts will be vision. You know, Helen Keller was quoted as saying that the only thing worse than blindness is a lack of vision. So how important is this in our lives? I think that the opening prayers that we say in our Birchat HaShachar, in the morning blessings, every morning gives us an indication on just how important the Anshei Knesset Agdo, the men of the Great Assembly, the editors of our daily prayers, thought vision was to our daily lives. The first blessing that we make in our morning prayers is Ano Sein Lesech Vivino, Lohavkin Ben Yom Ben Loyle, which translates to mean, blessed is he who has given the rooster the understanding to distinguish between day and night. So we begin our prayers, our request to our Father in Heaven, <clears throat> with a request that just as he has given the rooster its understanding, so too should he bless us with our understanding. We ask him for intelligence so that we should be able to distinguish between what is good and what is evil in order that we can live our lives properly in this challenging world. In the silent prayer in the Amida, a prayer which we recite three times daily, <clears throat> there are 13 blessings in which we make our personal request to God. The first request is for God to instill within us wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Since without these three blessings, we would find it difficult, if not impossible, to navigate our way through this minefield that we call life. Going back to the morning blessings, after we have asked God to give us wisdom and understanding, we now ask him to give us sight. We bless God for pokeach ivrim, which translates to mean giving sight to the blind. If you look at the wording of this blessing, I think that your first thought would be that it was a request for physical sight to not, God forbid, be blind. However, if you look closer at the wording of the blessing, that is not what it is saying at all. This is not a prayer asking God to miraculously give sight to those who are physically blind. No, no. I believe that it is a plea to God, our Father in heaven, to help us to not only be blessed with physical sight, but maybe even more important, an internal vision. The ability to be able to see with one's mind's eye. The ability to look past the obvious and see its true essence, vision. If we look into the Torah, we can see two different scenarios where vision played an important part in the final outcome of the story. The first story begins in the desert of Paran. The children of Israel camped outside the land of Canaan. They would soon begin their conquest of the land. In the fourth book of the Torah, in the beginning of the portion of Shalach, God tells Moshe that if he wants, he can send spies into the land to bring back information about the people, the land, and the fortification, spies. Each of the 12 tribes choose their own candidate to represent their tribe in the mission each tribe looking out for its own interests. All the men who were chosen were elite individuals, all of them, all of them were leaders. Some say that when we are reduced to them by name, they are actually listed in the order of their spiritual status. Yoshua, Joshua was listed fifth. The Torah testifies that at this time, Kulam Sadikim, Kulam, pardon me, Kulam Anoshim, that they were all special individuals. Yet somehow 10 of these elite individuals were the cause of the Jewish nation traveling in the desert for another 38 years. They were complicit in creating a negative moment in time, one that has plagued the Jewish nation throughout its history again and again. 1492, the expulsion from Spain and the beginning of World War I. Again, all on Tisha B'Av and many other examples. Tisha B'Av the ninth day of the month of all. What was their sin? How could these illustrious leaders be so blind to all that was happening around them, a true lack of vision? They only saw what they wanted to see. Anything that didn't fit into their narrative, they deleted. Those things that they could, could and should have recognized as the hand of God leading them on their journey, 
they totally ignored or misinterpreted. So let us look at the facts. The nations of Canaan knew that the children of Israel would one day come to take the land that God had promised to their forefathers. We say in our morning prayers daily in the Oz Yashir that after the crossing of the sea and the drowning of the Egyptian army, that Moshe and the people sang this song, this praise to God, Oz Yashir. In this prayer we say, Shamu Amen, your gozum that the nations heard and they trembled. The nations of Canaan had heard about the fate of the Egyptians. They were certain that they now have, would have to face a Jewish nation and its God, and they were petrified. The whole nation was at their borders. You would have thought that they would have had lookouts, sentries on the road, monitoring the movements of the Jewish army. But nowhere do we read that they traveled the spies by night which would have been dangerous and, again, against Jewish law. Nor do we read that Moshe warned them to keep a low profile, try to blend in. We read nothing. So 12 able-bodied men went on a journey. The Rashi tells us should have taken 160 days. They were able to complete their mission in only 40 days. Nor does it state that they changed their clothing to blend in with the local populace. This in itself should have been an indication to them that they were being helped by God. Nor does it say they changed their language, which would have meant that when they would have conversed with each other, it would have been either in Egyptian or Hebrew. Whenever you hear people talking in a foreign language, somehow you hear it very clearly. It, it catches your attention even though you may not understand a word that they're saying. So you have a group of 12 able-bodied men, strangers to the area, dressed in strange garb, speaking foreign, a foreign language, yet hmm, no one challenges them. We read in the Torah in the portion of the case with the story of Yosef in Egypt. Yaakov tells his 10 sons when he sends them to Egypt that when they enter the city to purchase grain, they should all enter through a different gate so as not to create any suspicion about their presence or their intentions. Yet here, all the spies traveled together as one group. Torah tells us that it was the harvest season, when the first grapes begin to ripen. Moshe tells the spies to make a special effort to bring back some of the produce of the land. You know, we see in the book of Ruth, that when Naomi tells Ruth to go to Boaz, it was during the harvest season. Boaz was sleeping in the field on the threshing floor. It seems that landowners would do so, so as to protect their harvest from thieves. Yet we read that 12 strange men were able to enter a field and take a cluster of grapes that was so large that it took eight men to carry and a fig and a pomegranate. Nowhere, nowhere do we read that they were challenged or questioned at all. There is a mention of them being concerned about their safety, but that was their own insecurities. No one actually confronted them. One would have thought that they would have recognized God's hand protecting them on their journey, vision. Everywhere that they traveled throughout the country, they found the populace burying their dead. They saw this as a negative. When they reported back to the people, they said that it was a land that consumed its inhabitants. Somehow they were not able to recognize the hand of God in all the funerals. It seemed that there was a local custom that when someone would die, they would not bury them immediately. What they would do is they would wait until an illustrious person would die. Then they would bury their family member at the same time that the illustrious person was being buried. This was done in the hope that the righteous individual would be able to bring all of his deceased countrymen together with him into paradise. You know, there are commentaries that say that the person who had died was Eve, Job. And that was why all the funerals were taking place at this time. So everywhere they traveled throughout the land, they found the populace burying their dead. This was a great advantage for them. For one, people were distracted in dealing with their funerals. In addition, when there are funerals in a city, it's not unusual for strangers to attend. All of this was orchestrated so that the spies could travel the land freely without any incidents. They saw what they wanted to see. 
even before they left the camp, based on Rashi. They had already had thoughts of speaking negatively about the land. After all, to them, the life that they were leading in the desert was paradise, a piece of the world to come. They didn't have to work for their food. The man fell every day. They lived in a sealed environment with the clouds of glory. They had all the water that they needed for themselves and their animals, the well of Miriam, a sea of water. And the sealed environment together with the sea of water gave them verdant gardens filled with all types of greenery. It truly was paradise. Why would they want to leave? You know, some time ago, one of my good friends went to Israel for the first time. I was excited about their trip, and I couldn't wait to hear about their experiences when they returned. When they returned, I was shocked to hear what their initial comments were. So much poverty. So much poverty. There is so much to see of the old and new Israel. <laughs> Everywhere you look, memories of the past blended with tributes to the present. New hotels, restaurants, malls. A beautiful modern country, all in an ancient setting. What a miracle in the desert. And all my friends saw was poverty. No vision. The spies saw their experience in the desert as a destination, not the journey. They felt that living in an ultra-religious environment was a utopia that anyone would want. Why go into the land? Why go to war for the land when they had everything they wanted in the desert? They said correctly that it was a land, Ochelos Yoshvel, a land that consumes its inhabitants. And by that they meant that when they entered the land, they would be forced to work the land as farmers, live as normal people. They would no longer have the luxury of spending their days learning Torah and serving God. They didn't want to leave the holy environment that they were privy to up until now. You know, they looked at the tabernacle, the sanctuary, a portable sanctuary that God had commanded them to construct and that they had just dedicated. But if God really wanted them to enter the land now, why would they need a portable sanctuary? It must have been that God's plan for them was to stay in the desert. Then the construction of a portable house for God would be needed. So what was their sin? They were in search of a closer relationship with God. They wanted to retain the elevated spiritual level that they were able to attain in the desert. They too had heard the prophecy from Eldad and Medad that Moshe would die and that Yeshua would be the one to lead them into the land. They yearned for a spiritual existence with Moshe, not his young student Yeshua as their leader. One has to remember that Yeshua at this time was much younger. He would not take over the leadership of the people of the nation for another 38 years. So at this time he was not yet seen as the person capable of taking over the leadership from his teacher and mentor. So their desire to stay in the desert may have initially been influenced by righteous concerns, but in the end, ego somehow always creeps in. Now they were leaders, and once they entered the land, everything would change. Who knew what their positions would be? Once someone has tasted from power and prestige, it's very hard to give up, even for the most righteous of us. We see this fact mentioned in a Medrash. After 40 years in the desert, the nation is about to enter the land. Moshe is then told by God that the time has come for Yeshua to take over the leadership of the nation. Moshe asks God that if he could enter the land as just one of the people, not as a leader. So the Medrash says that God, so to speak, shows Moshe a video. Moshe sees himself sitting amongst the people, listening to Yeshua, giving them a lecture on the laws of the Torah. After the vision, Moshe says to God, kill me. The spies had the best of intentions, but as the saying goes, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. <clears throat> Their mission was only to collect information, not to make decisions. In their minds, they thought that they were serving God when in reality, they were serving themselves. They committed the greatest sin of all. Their report caused the whole nation to sin. There's no greater sin than causing others to sin. It's God's world, and we are all obligated to follow his commands, whether we think they are best for us or not. It's only God who really knows what is best for us in the long run. 
Now, we think we know better. History has proven that the path of godliness is the only path to follow. We don't need to innovate. We just need to follow vision. You know, with Avraham, Abraham, our father, and the story of the Akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak, we see a totally different scenario. God asked Avraham to bring up his son Yitzchak as a human sacrifice. This request went against everything, everything that Avraham had preached to the world all of his life. It was a time in history when people would bring their children up as sacrifices to their idols. Avraham Avinu fought mightily against this practice. God was asking him to not only kill his beloved son, whom he had waited to father until he was 100 years old, God was asking Avram to destroy any and all credibility that he had built up in the world. When people would hear that he, Avram, had sacrificed his own son, he would be the ridicule of all those that would meet him. His ability to convert people to serve the one and only God would be totally lost. He was about to kill his precious son and his reputation with one stroke of his knife. One would think that Avram would question God. Maybe he misunderstood. No. The verse clearly says that not only does he follow God's request, he gets up early in the morning and saddles his own donkey so as to fulfill God's request with an alacrity. He doesn't hesitate. He even prepares all that he would need to bring his sacrifice wood, fire, a knife. He doesn't leave anything up to chance. There's no room for error. God doesn't make the test easy for him. For openers, God has to travel for three days before he comes to the place where God wanted the binding of Yitzchak to occur. His decision to kill the son could not be attributed to a spur-of-the-moment occurrence. He had three whole days to think about what he was about to do. The Medrash says that for those three days, the Sutton was bombarding him with all types of questions and arguments. The Sutton kept saying to him, think it over, think it through, think it over. How could God ask you to kill your righteous son? Well, this went on for three days. Avram Avina was tortured by all the questions, logic. He had no answers. Only that this was God's will. Purposely, God had removed his presence from Avram so as to make the test a true test of Avram's love and obedience to his creator. You know, there's a measure that says that Avram had to ford a river to get to the top of the mountain. The river kept getting deeper and deeper. And when the water finally reached his nose, he cried out to God to help him. There are those who say that there actually was no river there at all. It was only an illusion alluding to the fact that he was drowning in a river of logic, logic that was questioning his mission. Now, normally, Avramavino felt God's presence in everything and anything that he did. Now, he felt lost. And the verse states, Vayaris HaMokim Erechok, translates, he saw the place from a distance. <clears throat> we read in our Passover Haggadah the words, Baruch HaMokim, which translates to mean, Blessed is the place. Our rabbis tell us that the word makam, place, can also be an allusion to God. Since we know that God is the place, meaning the world is within God, God is not within the world. So when the verse tells us he saw the makam, the place, from a distance, it's alluding to the fact that although that though Avram may have felt God's presence in that moment, pardon me, that though he may not have felt God's presence in the moment, still, when he looked into his past, he saw God's presence very clearly. He then knew with complete certainty that just as God had always been with him in the past, so too was he with him in the present. The river that was drowning him in logic then somehow disappeared. Originally, his vision had been blurred by the Sutton, but in the end, his inner godly eye was able to see clearly what his mission was, and he moved toward it with strength and determination. His vision brought about a greater closeness to God and solidified his place in history as the father of the Jewish nation and the world at large. He did not try to dictate to God nor analyze God's decisions. His vision allowed him to see God. The vision of the spies, 
allow them to see only themselves. Isn't it interesting, though, that before Moshe dies, he tells this new generation that is about to enter the land in Achib, chapter 9, verse number 1. He tells them, and I quote, that when you arrive, you will drive out nations greater and more powerful than you, with great cities fortified to the heavens. They are a great nation as tall as giants. It's interesting that Moshe said to the people, even stronger words that were said by the spies. One would have thought that these words might have brought out fear and apprehension in the people. But they didn't panic, not like their fathers did. But why? Answer, they were free men with the desire to live a life based on freedom. The generation that left Egypt, or as the Rambam describes, a slave nation with a slave mentality. They were slaves, bricklayers. But their children, uh, they were trained soldiers. They were not afraid to conquer the land. They had grown up with one dream, one dream, to enter the promised land. That was their mantra. Much like today with the words the young Lubavitcher children are taught, we want Mashiach now. They were ready. Their vision was clear and unwavering. It was one of happiness and success. There was only one direction they wanted to move in, forward, never backwards, always following God's direction. So, so too we see the binding of Yitzhak has become one of our most powerful and influential prayers, one that we recite daily. A true lesson for us, especially today living in the world, that can't seem to find an amiable solution to all the challenges that we find in our daily lives. All of these challenges exist even though we live in the richest society that the world has ever experienced. Yes, success is a hard pill to follow, swallow. Though neither Avram nor Yitzhak understood why Avram was about to sacrifice his beloved and righteous son, they both knew with complete certainty that they were about to fill, fulfill God's command. Knowing that it was God's command was enough. They had a true vision of God. They understood that life belongs to God. He gives it, he can take it away. He's not required to supply us with answers as to why he directs his world in this manner or that. We need to learn from these two events. That one, that it's God's world. He knows what is best for us in the world at large. He doesn't need our suggestions or advice. He has a game plan. He gave us an instruction manual. We just need to follow its direction. When we think that we know better, that we should innovate, huh. guess what? We are following the path of the spies. So let us, con con let us connect to our strength, our Father in heaven, and ask him to help us to have the vision to find and follow the proper path that will usher in the coming of Mashiach Sekenu quickly and in our time. We want Mashiach now. Thank you very much for listening. May God bless you and yours with health, happiness, and joy in everything that you do. And again, thank you again for listening, and uh, have a great Shabbat.